Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, do you ever wonder whether you have any value in the church? Indeed, we all have value or have a significant role to play in the church. Everyone has received a gift and we must use it to build up one another. Paul said that we are members of the body of Christ. If one organ, like an eye, is not functioning, the whole body can still function, but it will not be able to function optimally. When you're absent from the church, the church can still grow, but will not be really strong due to your absence or unwillingness to use a gift to serve. Some of us have become lazy, discouraged or irresponsible and are no longer exercising the gift. We should, not, we should not be passive or lazy believers. One day we have to give an account of ourselves to God. We have to stand before Him and report to Him how we use our talents and gifts. So we must be faithful. We need to fan into flame the gifts that we have received. To fan into flame means to work hard to use the gift again. That means to use an opportunity available to serve, to keep on serving and to serve in a bigger capacity. Now I will lead us to say the opening prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for placing us in your family. We were once far from you, but you adopted us and made us your children. We are now seated with Christ in the heavenly places and in the new heavens and the new earth. We will reign with you. Father, we are grateful that we are not slaves because a slave doesn't have a permanent place in that family. You have made us heirs or co-heirs of Christ. We'll be able to enjoy the riches of your kingdom. Father, help us to always remember that this world is not our home, for we are just passing through. Help us to store our treasures in heaven, where thieves can't steal and where moths can't destroy. We ask that you will always protect us, lead us and empower us to live for your holy purpose. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We now have a time of worship. Let's worship the Lord wholeheartedly. If we were to attend a concert and find a singer singing half-heartedly, I think we will demand our money back. I don't think anyone us want our spouse or lover to love us half-heartedly, like food not cooked properly or bed not made neatly. We want him or her to love us wholeheartedly. So when we worship the Lord, we, sh we should worship him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We should mean it when we sing the songs. God is good all the time. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Let us raise his voice and worship him. Remember, can move around.
I want to talk about the new heaven and the new earth. I think everyone has a desire to live forever. Am I right? Those who want to live forever, would you want to raise your hands? There are some who don't want to raise their hands. Huh? You mean you don't want to live forever? <laughs> hmm. We wish we can live forever in this world, but the reality is we can't. The first emperor of China, Shi Huangdi, he unified China. He was a great emperor. He did a lot of big projects for China. He unified the country. He built the Great Wall of China. He gave them a common writing. He standardized the ways and measures. He had one obsession, to be able to live forever. So I sent his people throughout his country to search for the substance that can end up being to live forever. At one point, he thought that mercury could help him to live forever. He drank some of it. Of course, we know that mercury is poisonous. It did not extend his life, rather shorten his life. Nowadays, there are some who think that science or genetic engineering can help us to live forever. Some people think that scientists might be able to find a gene that causes aging and dying. If they, they, if they can tinker with it, if they can repair it, that will stop aging and dying. But I don't think that is possible. For the Lord has expressly said, the sinner that sins will die. Even if scientists can succeed in reversing aging or extending our life, I don't think we will be happy to live in such a world. Now, this world is a very difficult place to live in. There are wars, there are natural disasters, there are food shortage, there are accidents, retrenchment. Now, we Sarakians feel very happy to live here. But if you ask the people in Gaza, I don't think they enjoy it. You ask the people in Ukraine, I don't think they enjoy it. They are suffering because of wars. Now, this one is not an easy place to live in because we have relationship problems. We have relationship, with, relationship problems with neighbors, with, with uh, colleagues, with relatives. We get cheated. We are pressured by our boss to perform and we are hurt by people. And the government introduces unfair policies. If people can live forever, that means evil rulers can rule forever. Imagine you are North Korean and you live, you are ruled by Kim Jong-un forever and ever. That thought is really terrible, right? Imagine you are Russian and be ruled by Putin forever and ever. That will be suffering indeed. Now, we won't be able to find immortality and happiness in this world. We can only receive it through our God. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And he will create a perfect society. Now, let's read Revelation Chapter 21, verse 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. In that new heaven, new earth, there be no more sin, no more death, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, and no more injustice. We will have the perfect society. We will have the perfect utopia or the perfect Shangri-La. Now let's come to this issue of why does God have to create a new heaven and a new earth? Aren't the old ones good? Now we'll first look at why God has to create a new heaven. Now we believe that the present heaven it's not a mystical place. It is a real and physical place. Now, the Bible doesn't expressly say that the present heaven is a real physical place. We come 
to this conclusion by extended reasoning. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose physically. He showed to his disciples the marks of his crucifixion. He ate a fish before them. He really, he really rose from the dead physically. And then 40 days, 40 days later, he ascended to heaven from Mount Olives. Since Jesus has a physical body, he must be in a physical place. So heaven is a physical place. It's a real physical place. And it has a physical location. Now the first man to orbit the earth was Yuri Gagarin in the 1960s. He orbited the earth and he said, I didn't see God. Now, he went to the wrong address. The universe is so big, we don't know where heaven truly is. But actually, there's a way for him to go there. He just needs to step out of the spacecraft and then he'll be in heaven and see God. After the millennium, the 1,000 year rule of Christ, after the final judgment, the present heaven will be replaced by a new heaven. The reason is because the layout or architecture of this present heaven has become obsolete, out of date, incompatible. Now the book of Hebrews tells us that the present heaven has a temple. There's a temple up there. And God has arranged the layout of this temple in such a way so as to depict or describe the salvation work of Jesus Christ. When God asked Moses to build an earthly temple or the tabernacle, he asked Moses to use the layout of the temple in heaven. Use that layout, use the architecture. Now let's read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 15. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 15. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human being. Verse 3. Every priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. They, referring to the priest, serve as a sanctuary. There's a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So this passage tells us that the layout of the temple on earth is essentially similar to the layout of the temple in heaven. And the layout of these two temples, the one on earth and the one in heaven, shows the salvation work of Jesus Christ. Now look at the layout of this temple on earth. Now this is the layout. Uh, you have the courtyard outside. You have the middle section called the holy place. And you have the innermost section called the most holy place. Now let's go inside to the holy place. Now in this holy place, you have three uh, pieces of furniture there. The table of showbread, the, te the lampstand, and the altar of incense. And the, the priests go in to this section to minister every day. Uh, they make sure there's always fresh bread, uh, there's always fresh oil for the lampstand, and they put fragrant wood on the altar of incense. This must continue non-stop. Now there's a curtain between the holy place and the most holy place. Now in the most holy place is the presence of God. 
But in this most holy place, let's see now, next picture, you can see something a bit like a box. That's called the Ark of the Covenant. You see two cherubim. The angels, the, their wings are sped up. Yeah. So you can see two wings. The two wings of the two cherub, uh, they touch each other. And under the two wings, uh, that middle section is called the mercy seat. So the high priest goes in once a year. He brings the blood of bull and sprinkle over the mercy seat. It's a procedure. It's a ritual to say that he's pleading for forgiveness for his sins and also the sins of the worshippers outside. Now, the layout of this temple depicts the ministry of Jesus Christ. The high priest represents Jesus. So Jesus Christ goes into the real temple in heaven. He doesn't bring the blood of animals. He brings his own blood to plead for us, to plead for forgiveness for our sins. So the layout of the temple describes or depicts the salvation ministry of Jesus Christ. Now after the millennium, after the final judgment, Jesus' salvation work is completed. All who must be saved will be in the new heaven and the new earth. All who don't believe are condemned and they'll be in the lake of eternal fire. So by that time, this temple, this layout is completely obsolete. God doesn't want to keep a museum. He doesn't want to keep a museum. So he'll replace the present heaven with a new heaven. Now why does God have to make a new earth? It's because the structure of the present earth will also become obsolete. As we know, at the moment, the earth has volcanoes, the earth has earthquakes. As we know, 71% of the world is covered by water, by sea. Now, in a new order, God will create a new climate system that is not based on the sea. We know that the world's weather is very much controlled by the sea. Yeah? But in a new order, the new climate system will not depend on the sea. There will be a new system. So the present earth will be incompatible, will not be, will be obsolete. So God will replace the present earth with a new one. Now, we will first look at our bodies, the type of bodies that we have in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, we have resurrected bodies, physical bodies, but sinless and can die. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that sown is perishable, is raised imperishable. This sown in dishonor is raised in glory. It is sown in witness, is raised in power. Is sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. Now this body has four qualities. First, imperishable. Second, glorious. Third, powerful. Fourth, spiritual. We won't sin anymore. The sinful nature has been eradicated, deleted. The devil has been locked up in the lake of eternal fire, so there's no more potential in us to sin against God. We won't grow old, we won't fall sick, we won't die. We won't have wrinkles, we won't have stomach aches, no more migraines, no more two aches. We won't have cancer, and there will be no more funerals. We will have complete bodies. There will be no one that blind. We won't wear dentures anymore. We have physical bodies with spiritual power. Physical bodies with spiritual power. 
Now the disciples were gathered in a room, the windows, the door were locked. Suddenly, Jesus appeared before them. He ate a fish before them, and then he disappeared. So the physical body that we will have at that time will be able to eat, but able to pass through the wall, go through material. That is a physical body with spiritual power. Now, how about our appearance? Let's read Luke chapter 9, verse 29 to 30. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. We will look awesome and overwhelming. Eh? Our faces and clothes will be bright light, lightning. Wow, we don't need makeup anymore. I think our parents look too overwhelming. Eh? I think I would like to ask the Lord to adjust a little bit. Lah. Adjust down, please. This is too overwhelming. Now, how about the appearance of those who die at the age of 80 or 90? How would they look like? The Bible doesn't tell us. But we can be sure their bodies will be glorious. Will be strong and glorious. Now, how about those who die at the age of a few years old? Or we know some children die. Just a few months old, they die already. But in what type of body will they appear at that time? Again, the Bible doesn't say so. But based on reasoning, since we are perfect, we are complete, we are mature, I think they will appear in adult bodies. And there will be no more marriage. Let's read Luke chapter 27, verse 34 to 36. Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die for their lady and Jews. Now, we will not become sexless. Uh, there will be no uh, structural change to your body. If you die a female, you are raised a female. If you, uh, if you die as a man, you are raised, you are resurrected as a man. But there is no more marriage. Your spouse will become your brother or sister. So Vicky will become my sister and maybe my neighbor. Yeah. Now some may ask, huh? No marriage, huh? Uh, no romance, huh? no more sex, no more dating. Huh? It must be very boring. No, it won't be boring. If God can give us sex that is so pleasurable, He can give us other and better pleasures. You must understand that God himself alone is full of pleasure. And when you are in him or with him, uh, you will experience tremendous pleasure. More pleasurable than any other pleasures you can ever experience. The psalmist say, in God are pleasures forevermore. Now we come to look at the characteristics of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, the new heaven and the new earth are not mystical places. We won't be floating in the clouds. We won't be walking three feet above the ground. The new heaven and the new earth are real places, physical places that you can walk on, you can touch, you can feel, you can smell. Now, why do I say that? Because... We're physical bodies, and we need a physical place. Now, to be honest, the Bible doesn't mention what the new heaven will be like. You only mention the new earth. Nothing is said about the new heaven. So we can't say anything about it. One Christian author speculated that the new heaven could be God's summer palace. 
God's retreat center. But that's not logical because God doesn't sleep. God doesn't need rest. He doesn't need recreation. He doesn't need holiday. He's just sufficient. And we just wonder what's in a new heaven. I think there are very exciting and wonderful, marvelous things in the new heaven. Now let me explain this way. Imagine you, you talk to Moses. Imagine if you can be transported back to the time of Moses when he was with his people in the wilderness, joining the wilderness for 40 years. And you talk to him, Moses, let me tell you, one day we can fly in the sky. We can even fly to the moon. We can travel very fast on cars. We have handphones, we use we have computers, we have movies, uh, we have cameras. Then we can record what we do. Do you think Moses can understand? Do you think Moses will believe you? I don't think I don't think he can understand. I don't think he can believe you. But several thousand years later, we have these things. Now you may wonder what is in the new heaven. Exactly what is inside there. It will be beyond what you can imagine. Something marvelous, something wonderful. God can do more than we dare to ask and believe. Now come to the new earth, the new earth. Now in the new earth, there's no more sun, no more moon. Let's read Revelation chapter 20, 21, verse 23 to 24. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. In this present world, the weather is regulated by the sun and the moon. Isn't it? The earth revolves around the sun. That's why the four seasons. And different parts of the world are at different distances from the sun. That's why we have areas that are colder, areas that are hotter. The North Pole is very far from the sun. We in the equator is very near the sun. That's why we are hot. But those who live in the North Pole, they feel cold. It's very, very cold. Now, in a world without sun and moon, there will be no more four seasons. There will be no more, no more hotter areas or colder areas. We will have a new climate system. Where does the light come from? Not from the sun, not from the moon, but from God himself. Light will emanate from his body. And, sh and uh, give light to the world and to the areas around. Now the new earth has a capital city called New Jerusalem. Now, this new Jerusalem is in the shape of a cuboid. The length, the width, and the height are the same. Now, this city is luxurious. It's beautiful. Now, the wall is made of jasper. Jasper has different types of colors. Now, the wall is made of jasper. And each side has three gates. And the gate is made of a pearl. Now let's see what the pearl looks like. Yeah? Uh, made of a single pearl. And each gate is guarded by the angel. And on each gate is written the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. It could be Jude, uh, what are the 12 tribes of Judah? Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Jebulun, and so on. And the gates are open day and night. So there's no queue, no need to get an entry pass. The wall of the city has 12 foundations or 12 pillars. And on each foundation of the wall is written the name of one of the 12 apostles. 
that the foundations are decorated with all kinds of precious stones. They have 12 foundations, so there are 12 different types of stones. What are they? Jasper, Sapphire, sapphire Agate, Emerald, Onyx, Ruby, ruby Chrysolite, Burial, Topaz, Turquoise, Jasmine, and Amethyst. And the size of the city is unimaginable. It's really, really huge, beyond expectation. As I say, the length, width, and height are the same. It's a cube. How long is it? 2,200 kilometers long, 2,200 kilometers wide, and the wall is 2,200 kilometers high. I check out the distance between Kuching and Kota Kinabalu. Let's see the map. You know what's the distance between Kuching and Kota Kinabalu by flight? It's about 805 kilometers. Just slightly a bit more than a third of the length of the New Jerusalem. That means we can put three Borneo Islands inside the city with some more space left. It's huge. And what makes it even remarkable is the height of the wall. As I said, it's 2,200 kilometers high. Now, I check out the cruising speed of the Airbus 320. It is about 829 kilometers per hour. 829 kilometers per hour. That means if you want to travel from the top of the wall to the ground of the New Jerusalem, if you can travel in an Airbus 320, I don't think there's Airbus 320 at that time, but if there's one and you bought this Airbus 320 from the top and fly down to the ground below, it takes almost about three hours. So if you come in from outer space, if you were to visit the new heaven and come back to the new earth to, and, you, and you see the new Jerusalem, it just blows your mind. It's huge, huge, huge. Seemingly endless. Amazing, amazing. Now we look at the housing in the New Jerusalem. There are many rooms or many houses in the city. Let's read John chapter 14, verse 1 to 2. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that was so, would I have, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So Christ is going to prepare a place for us to stay. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell us whether God will give us a room or God will give us a mansion. Will he build a condo for us, uh, a house for us, or a studio for us? He doesn't say. I think it's not good to know too much, right? That makes a wedding more Exciting. Hmm. Now the streets of the city will be made of gold. Made of gold. Yeah. I heard of some rich people who have gold toilets, who have gold taps for their bathroom, but yet to hear, you know, streets, roads paved with gold. And this is not ordinary gold. The gold is transparent, as clear as glass. Have you seen gold as clear as glass? No, we only seen gold yellow in color, not transparent. But this is gold as transparent as glass. It's a little bit like that. Amazing, huh? Amazing. Now God and Jesus will live in the new Jerusalem, not in the new heaven, new Earth in New Jerusalem. Now their thrones will be in the city and we will be able to see the face of God. Just imagine we can see the face of God. Now at this time, God is invisible to us. We can't see Him. 
People say, I'll, I'll believe if I see God. But to tell you the truth, you can't see Him. Why? Because your present body is not able to support your desire to see Him. I give an illustration. I think many of you have used the old Nokia, right? You know old Nokia? Yeah. My time I used the old Nokia, no? the old handphone. Can the old Nokia support you watching a video? Cannot. But you want to watch video on handphone, you must upgrade, right? To a smartphone. And all Nokia can't support this. So you want to see God, this present body cannot do it. It's not able to. God is perfect. He is glorious. He is mighty. He is holy. But we are sinful. We are weak. So this present body is not able to see God. If God would appear to you now in his physical form, you'll be dead. How do I know? If I can reduce the sun to a small ball like this and put it in front of you, you will die. You'll vanish. And he's the one who's greater than the sun. He met the sun. So there's no way this present body can see him. But in our resurrected bodies, we're able to. That body can see him, can see his face. Now, God will end every form of suffering. Let's read Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. God will reset our memory. We will no longer remember our past sins, our past mistakes, the foolish things that we did. Those hurts that we suffer from other people, we won't remember them anymore. Now sometimes we do have flashback or we recall the, the, the wrong words we said to other people, the bad things we do to other people, the mistakes. Now when we recall, how, how do we feel? I think we feel very bad, right? We feel very foolish, we feel very guilty. Now God will remove all this. God will reset our memory. We won't be able to remember these things anymore. Yeah? We will be immortal, we can live forever, but this immortal life needs to be constantly replenished by God. Now let's read Revelation chapter 21, chapter 22, verse 1 to 2. Huh? Let's read Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 to 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now we will be immortal, but we need to constantly eat the fruit of the tree of life to remain immortal. And this constant eating shows our constant dependence on God for the immortal life. And what, we do, what do we do in the new heaven and new earth? Now some people think that the new earth is a big retirement village. People have nothing to do, just walk slowly, laze around, have afternoon tea, talk to each other, chit chat, laugh, strum guitars, play harps. Everything happens so slowly. No, 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 no. You're wrong. You're wrong. The new earth is not an big retirement village. There are things for us to do, exciting and good things for us to do. Now, no doubt, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 talks about resting in God. Huh? He's talking about the contents of you dying and you're resting in God. 
Now, resting doesn't mean resting from activities, resting from doing things. It means resting from your struggle against sin, against the devil, against your sinful nature, against suffering. That's the type of rest the book of Hebrews mentioned. Unfortunately, some Christians think, oh, rest, 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 it means nothing to do. No, that's not true. There will be things to do. Of course, the first thing we have to do is we worship God. We worship God. But we won't worship God all the time. All the time in God's presence, lying prostrate there, forever and ever. No, worship is only a part of the things that we will do. Now let's read Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. Go back to uh, this uh, Revelation 22, verse 2. Now notice verse 2 there. The, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There are still nations. Huh? I just wonder, what are these nations? Who live there? Now this seems to indicate that seems, uh, we speculate a little bit. Huh? Uh, we must know we're speculating, but this is not absolute truth. It could be that God create new groups of beings, new groups of beings in these nations. And they constantly need to depend on the leaves of the tree of life to stay healthy and strong. And we'll be ruling over them. Because if we read Revelation, we find that we are with God in the new Jerusalem, in the city. And who are they outside there? Who bring their glories to the new Jerusalem. It could be new beings. And God will ask us to be in charge of them. Now the parables of Jesus clearly show that we have important duties and tasks to do in the new, heaven, new earth. Now Jesus gave a parable of a master who gave a mina to each of his ten servants. And after his return, he asked for accounting for report from them. Let's read Luke chapter 19, verse 16 to 19. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. The reverse are different, huh? One servant is asked to take charge of ten cities, and the other asked to take charge of five cities. They don't receive similar rewards. Some got more, some got less. So some are asked, might get more rewards in heaven, some less. So you will ask, oh, Pastor Wong, that means there's inequality in heaven. Then we won't be happy. He has more, I have less. But it's a perfect society. We've been changed. Even though there's inequality, you won't feel sad. You won't feel bad. Then some say, in that case, I don't know what to hard law. I just work a little bit. I can be a gatekeeper. I can be a street sweeper. Just do a little bit enough. Now, if there's a reasoning, you're very ignorant. You're just like a student who has the potential ability to score nine A's. But you just work a little bit, you're not get nine C's. Isn't that very unfortunate? You can more, you can do more for God, but you're lazy, you just do a little bit only. You have great potential. God has given me good gifts. Use it. Go all the way out. Now, the doctrine of the new heaven and new earth has a great bearing on a present life. It will affect you. It will affect you in three ways. First one, it will motivate us to serve the Lord. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not 
in vain. We will be rewarded. Christ will appreciate us. This rewards will be a motivation. Your teaching in the Sunday school is not in vain. No? Your archering is not in vain. Your visit to the sick brother or sister in hospital is not in vain. You clean this place, nobody knows, it's not in vain. God sees it all and He'll reward you. Secondly, how can, how can it affect us? you will give us strength to endure suffering because we know that for those who suffer, they will be blessed. They will be rewarded. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 to 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is the reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the, Christ, the prophets who were before you. If you are scolded by your parents because you are Christian, you will be rewarded. If you are retrenched or dismissed by your boss because of Christian faith, Christian stand, you will be rewarded. If you are rejected by your non-Christian friends because of a faith in Christ, you will be rewarded. Great rewards. The present sufferings may be very painful, but when you reach the when you reach New Jerusalem, you will see that all these sufferings are just like mosquito bites. Thirdly, we will be motivated to be faithful in giving. Now let's read Matthew chapter 6, verse 90 to 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. We are asked to transfer our wealth to heaven. You know John Wesley, the British Methodist preacher during the 18th century, he preached on horseback. He preached throughout Britain and so many people received Christ. He was first an Anglican. He didn't plan to build the Methodist church, but because the Anglicans rejected him, he had no choice but to start the Methodist church movement. He became a Methodist church. He was a great preacher. People fell down when he preached. The power of God fell down. And John Wesley earned a lot of money from his book writing. He earned as much as 300,000 pounds through his book writing. He lived a very simple life. He gave away a lot of money. After he died, his followers discovered he had only a few coins in his drawer. Just left a few coins. The rest he gave all. John Wesley transferred all his wealth to heaven. So knowledge of this truth, new heaven, new earth, will motivate us to give, to be generous in our giving. Amen.
VM Sarawak has a seminary called Malaysia Evangelical Theological Seminary with campuses in Miri, Lawas, Bakalalan, Lor Lama and Balaga. Our church, BM Brasta, is supporting three students. They are Satiban Peter in Lawas, Pagat Libat in Miri and Uking Jemo in Balaga. We believe in investing in their future. BM Brasta is not an independent church. We are under the Borneo Evangelical Mission denomination. Our denomination headquarters is in Miri. It's headed by the president who is assisted by a vice president, a secretary and a treasurer. BN Sarawak has about 100,000 members in Sarawak. We have more than 500 congregations in the towns and villages in Sarawak. And they are served by more than 500 pastors. Our denomination's beliefs are evangelical. Three Australian missionaries came to Sarawak in 1929 to preach the gospel. They came under the umbrella of this organization called Borneo Evangelical Mission, which was established in Australia for the sole purpose of preaching the gospel in Borneo. That's how our de denomination came to be called Borneo Evangelical Mission <clears throat> or BM.
Let me now uh, say the closing prayer. Father, Father in heaven, how we praise thy holy name. We pray that you will continue to give us opportunities to preach the gospel. Please open the eyes of the non-believers. Some of them are so blinded by the God of this world until they don't realize that they need a savior. Their hearts have become very hard. Father, have mercy on their lostness. Please come to them. Convict them of their sins and the dire need of a savior. Lead us to them, and as we share with them, they will be so repentant and so sincere in the profession of faith in Jesus. O oh Lord, you don't want anyone to perish, so please have mercy on the sinners. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Music